the duty with regard to the Noble Eightfold Path, the fourth Noble Truth, is that you develop it. Think about the implications of that, a truth that you develop. It's not already, already true for you. It's not sitting out there someplace already true that you can verify without giving rise to it within yourself. It reminds you of William James' distinction between truths of the observer and truths of the will. Truths of the observer, the more you want something to be a certain way, the less likely you are to see it as it actually is. With truths of the will, it requires that you want it to be true for it to actually become true. For example, if you want to become a musician, for that to become true requires work on your part. If you just sit around waiting for it to become true, it's not going to happen. This is why when the Buddha was asked how many people would follow the path and all the way to awakening, he didn't answer. It was going to depend on each person's choices. So the fact that this is a truth that you develop means, one, that you have to do it. Which is why the Buddha said, you don't simply go by texts, what's said in the books. You learn about right view. When you first learn about it, it's just words. But the words seem to make sense. But to know whether they're true or not, whether they point you in the right direction, you have to put them into practice. That's why when the Buddha was talking to the Kalamas, he told them, don't go by texts, don't go by teachers. Also, don't go by what seems reasonable to you. And these things can inspire you to practice, but you can't take them as the final arbiter of truth. So when you put a particular teaching into practice and see what kind of results you get, that's when you know whether you found something truly good or not. And even though the path begins with right view, right view doesn't become really right until you've developed the path as a whole. Right view is something that you develop. It's not just there. How right it is, you're not going to know until you've performed all the duties for all the noble truths. That includes developing all the factors of the path. You see this in some of the other ways that the Buddha lines up the factors of the path. This is when he talks about the the five strengths of the five faculties. For discernment to become a faculty, in other words, a dominant factor in your mind, you have to actually develop conviction, persistence. That includes developing virtue, and then mindfulness and concentration. In other words, all the factors of the path have to be developed for the right view to really become strong, to, be have, a, <clears throat> to have a good, solid foundation. Not only do you have to do the path, but you have to be true in doing it. A while back I was reading a piece by someone saying that the Buddha was a good postmodernist, and he didn't claim that anything was particularly true, that each person had to find his or her own truth. But you look at the way the Buddha taught. He wasn't just spinning out ideas. He had actually tested these things. And he also gave a training in being true. You see this in the Vinaya. There are three areas in the Vinaya where truth is really important. One is being true in your perceptions. In other words, you, there are rules that really depend on how truly you perceive the object, how truly you perceive the situation. It will determine how serious the offense is. So you really have to be careful about how you perceive things. Then there's the issue of accusations. On the one hand, the person who's being accused has to give a truthful account of what he did and what he didn't do. And the person who's making the accusation has to give a truthful account of what is the basis for his accusation. Is it based on something that he saw, something that he heard, or simply something that he suspected? And he has to be truthful in accounting for that. And these three kinds of truth carry over into the practice.
think about the Buddha's instructions to Rahula. The very first instruction was about being truthful, reporting truthfully what you've done, and observing truthfully what you've done. As you said, if you lack the quality of truthfulness, then your quality of a contemplative is very little, thrown away, turned over, empty. The image he gave was with a water dipper. Rahula had set out some water for the Buddha to wash his feet, and the Buddha left a little bit of the water in the dipper. He said, see how little there is in this dipper? That's how little of a goodness there is in someone who's, who has told a deliberate lie with no sense of shame. Then he threw it away. See how that's been thrown away? Then he showed him the empty dipper, see how empty it is? And then he turned it over, see how overturned it is? In each case, it was a symbol for what happens to the goodness of someone who tells a deliberate lie with no sense of shame. That's the very basis of the practice. And then he tells Rahula to look at his actions before, as he's intending an action, while he's doing it, after he's done it. In each case, if he anticipates harm, he shouldn't do the action. Or if he sees the action is causing harm, while well, he engages in the action, he should stop. And looks over the long term, after the action is done, to see if there was some harm done, then he should resolve not to repeat it, develop a sense of shame around that action, the healthy kind of shame. And this depends on the ability to notice exactly what's happening, that ability to make sure your perceptions are in line with the truth gets born out here. The ability to give a truthful account of what you've done, so you can know what cause and effect are, what really is skillful, what's not skillful, gets born out here as well. There's that other introductory instruction that the Buddha gave to Rahula before he taught him meditation, is to make your mind like earth. In other words, he's not telling Rahula simply just to sit and watch and do nothing. But he is saying, make your mind strong, so you can really be a good observer. This is an important, important part of truthfulness as well. Remember that the Buddha's comment that what he wanted in a student was that the student, one, be observant, and two, be truthful. Here in talking to Rahula, he's given the instructions on how to do that. And part of that is, make your mind really solid, so it's not perturbed by pleasant or unpleasant things. You're not running away from what's unpleasant. You're not running toward what's pleasant. Because if you're running around, you can't see anything. You have to make the mind solid, unshakable, if you want to see the truth. And that's for giving an account of where your knowledge comes from. It's very important that you know that when you believe something, you have to be true to yourself and, well, why do I believe this? You have some really strong, true believers who are, whose knowledge is based on what they've heard, or what they've read. But that's not knowledge. It's hearsay. And so you have to be very careful of yourself to make sure that when you believe something, you have to be clear about why you believe it. The Buddha calls this safeguarding the truth, and it's a quality you need as you practice, so that you can look at what you believe and ask yourself, well, how solidly based is that particular opinion? Do I really know it? Because when you're following the path, it's not simply a matter of following instructions. As the Buddha said, the Dharma is nourished by committing yourself, in other words, you really truthfully practice it as best you can as honestly as you can. And then you reflect, what are the actual results you're getting? That's in the reflection that you learn. And you can actually see, you did this, you got these results. And you've been, been trained in being truthful about getting a truthful account of what you've done, and being clear about your perceptions of things, making sure they're accurate then your reflection is going to bear fruit. Think of the Buddha's instructions in mindfulness, learning how to recognize states of mind, 
as they arise and figure out if something has arisen. Is it something that should be abandoned or is it something that should be developed? You have to have a clear perception. When a hindrance arises, you have to recognize it as a hindrance. When something connected with the factors of awakening arises in the mind, you have to recognize that too, because then you know what to do with it. Otherwise, you start listening to your desires or listening to your ill will or listening to your doubts or stomping all over whatever mindfulness or concentration you may have, because it may not fit in line with what you thought concentration should be like. I suffered from that myself in the very beginning. I was pretty sure that if your mind got concentrated, you had to have visions, and there were no visions. So I told myself I obviously had wrong concentration, so I just threw away what I had and tried to find something else. It took me a while to realize the concentration was there. It just wasn't doing what my preconceived notions had told me it would do. I was throwing away things that I should develop. So we're dealing with the truth that you do, and you have to be true in doing it if you want to find the truth, if you want that truth to become true within you. The word for developing in Pali basically means making become, bringing into being. So even though the Buddha's image is of a path, we think of a path as something that's already there and you just follow it. And there's a sense that you follow the instructions. But it's a path where you have to build the bridges or the valleys. In other words, you have to do some construction work here. This is why the Buddha also uses that analogy of the raft. You put together the raft out of what? Twigs and branches on the side of the river. In other words, your fabrications of the five aggregates. You put them together in a way that will take you across the river. And while you're crossing, you hold on. And then when you get to the other side, that's when you let it go. Because after all this, in either case, whether it's a raft or a path, it's a means to an end. And the end is something very different from the means. After all, the path is fabricated, put together. The goal we're going for is something unfabricated. So there will come a point where you have to put it down, the path. But before you do that, you have to make it true. So one, you do it. Two, you're true in doing it. And that's how you guarantee the truth. Because no one's going to come into your mind and say, Bing, you got it. You have to learn how to make yourself trustworthy so you can trust your judgments about what's happening your judgments about what you're doing and the results you're getting. And this is one of the reasons why, why we have the vinya for the monks and the precepts for the lay people. They give you practice in being true on a day-to-day -day level. Being true in your perceptions, true in your accounts of what you've done, and true in your acknowledgment of the basis of your knowledge. And when you can develop those kinds of truth, then you're in a position where you can judge. Does the noble eightfold path actually lead to the end of suffering? That's something that only true people can know. <laughs>